The Ruth Page School of Dance is auditioning dancers for its civic ballet training company, designed to serve as a bridge between training and professional performance for serious dancers ages 17 to 22. Find more information at ruthpage.org. Hi, dance friends, and welcome to the Dance Edit Podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. I'm Courtney Escoyne. And I'm Cadence Neenan. We are editors at Dance Media, and we are recording in the middle of a truly overwhelming mainstream news cycle following the shooting of Dante Wright on Sunday, which happened just a few miles from the Minneapolis courthouse where Derek Chauvin is on trial for the murder of George Floyd. We hope you're all doing what you need to do to take care of yourselves this week. So in today's episode, we will be talking about the anti-racism consulting business launched by a former Joffrey ballet dancer that is helping to break the dance world's cycle of trauma. We will get into why the tech industry needs artists and especially dancers. We'll talk about what the dance world generally and then us hosts specifically have learned from a year of online dance. And then we'll have our interview with Duke Dang, who is the general manager of the Guggenheim's Works and Process series. And Duke is one of the most gifted arts administrators in the business. He is passionate about arts admin. And we had this fascinating and, as he put it, really nitty gritty conversation about how Works and Process pioneered performing arts bubble residencies early in the pandemic, because they were really among the first to do that, and then how they were able to safely return to live performances beginning last month, which is much sooner than the rest of, of New York City. They're really pioneers on multiple fronts. Okay, we are actually going to dive right into our headline rundown this week because there is a lot of dance news to get to. So Courtney, go for it. In a recent feature in The Hollywood Reporter, film and Broadway producer Scott Rudin was accused of abuse, intimidation, and vindictiveness by former assistants and staffers going back decades. Rudin's portfolio, of course, includes last year's Broadway revival of West Side Story and upcoming high-profile revivals of The Music Man and Our Town, and is one of the organizers behind the New York Pops Up Festival. Uh, some members of the theater community have expressed solidarity with those who came forward in the Hollywood Reporter piece on social media, with several drawing parallels to Harvey Weinstein and the culture of fear that kept people from speaking out sooner, and I suspect many from speaking out now. Yeah, and it, it should be noted, too, that since the release of the expose, three theater unions have released a joint statement condemning generally harassment and toxic workplaces in the industry. We'll link to coverage of that, as well as the original Hollywood Reporter expose in the show notes. Los Angeles' Music Center will return to live performances in May for the first time since the onset of COVID-19, starting with a series of four star-studded outdoor dance programs. Each of the four Dance at Dusk performances will be an hour long without intermission, and because the programs begin before California's full reopening, will feature abundant health and safety protocols. The first dance presentation will be a top performance by Dormisha, Jason Samuel Smith, and Derek K. Grant, and later in the summer, audiences can catch performances by American Ballet Theater, Paul Taylor Dance Company, and Alonzo King Lions Ballet. Uh, and in further season announcement news, uh, the Kennedy Center has announced its 50th anniversary season to kick off in September. It is, unsurprisingly, absolutely packed, but of particular interest to us dancer folk. Uh, the premiere of a new site-specific commission from Ragamala Dance Company, the return of American Ballet Theater, New York City Ballet, and Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, which, like, fun fact, uh, Ailey performed new work by Alvin Ailey at the opening of Kennedy Center in 1971. Did not know this dance history tidbit. I love knowing this dance history tidbit now. And uh, also a very busy musical theater season that will include recent-ish Broadway hits Hades Town, Ain't Too Proud, The Prom, Daniel Fish's Oklahoma, The Band's Visit, and Hamilton, among many others. Can't wait for everything to feel recent-ish again when we haven't seen it in so long. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Black Dance Stories is presenting new episodes in April, and this month the dance series features many iconic figures, including Robert Garland, Alice Shepard, Amy Hall Garner, and Robert Battle. The series streams live on YouTube Thursdays at 6 p.m., and prior episodes are available on the Black Dance Stories YouTube channel as well. 
And a hearty congratulations to Catlin Addison and Hadriel Denise at Ballet West, who have been promoted to principal artists beginning with the new season. Catlin is the first black dancer and Hadriel the first Brazilian to become principals at Ballet West. And in other roster updates, principals Catherine Lawrence and Erilyn Williams announced that they will be retiring at the end of the current season. Uh, She Loves You, a new musical featuring music by the Beatles, is in development for a spring 2022 premiere in Copenhagen. The musical will feature Beatles hits like Let It Be, Blackbird, Across the Universe, and more, as well as choreography from renowned director and choreographer Nick Winston, who you may know from West End productions like Fame and Annie. And in more musical news, A Beautiful Noise, a biographical musical about Neil Diamond, is planning a pre-Broadway run at Boston's Emerson Colonial Theater beginning June 2022. At the helm of the creative team is Spring Awakening director Michael Mayer. Stephen Hoggett, who worked on Once and Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, is attached to choreograph. I'm going to have Sweet Caroline stuck in my head for the rest of the week. (laughs) HBO is getting Magic Mike back on stage in the form of a new dance competition show called The Real Magic Mike. The series, in part produced by Magic Mike star Channing Tatum, will feature 10 male performers competing for a chance to perform at the Magic Mike live stage shows in Las Vegas. Sounds magical. You know what? I'm on board. I'm in. (laughs) I am. I I stand Channing Tatum. I think he's great. He's so talented. I'm in. (laughs) Uh, researchers in China have unearthed a large concentration of fossilized dinosaur footprints. According to a paleontologist from China University of Geosciences, some 200 dinosaur tracks were unearthed in a 100 square meter area, with the number expected to exceed 1,000 footprints as excavation continues. But wait, you're probably saying, what does this have to do with dance? (laughs) Nothing, really, except the fact that apparently areas with large concentrations of dinosaur tracks are termed dinosaur dance floors, which I did not know and am utterly delighted by. That is the scientific term. It's <laughs> Why do I excellent. want to visit a dance floor just with dinosaurs? Like, dance with them now? Feeling... My, my immediate thought was that is an excellent band and or song name. And so I googled it and there is, in fact, a song called Dinosaur Dance Floor. It's not good, in case you're wondering. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing the important research. <laughs> Hard hitting. <laughs> Many of Spain's tablaos, the intimate venues that play a crucial role in the country's flamenco sector, will not survive the pandemic. While many theaters in Spain have reopened already, social distancing rules make reopening financially unviable for intimate spaces like tablaos. Since the start of the pandemic, 34 of the 93 tablaos in the National Association of Tablaos have closed. And according to the president of the National Association, if the government doesn't step in to provide financial support soon, tablaos are heading for extinction. This is one of those things that I'm like, yes, more government support because these are so important culturally. But then I also like have to believe in my heart and my soul that flamenco has survived so much Mm -hmm. like this uh, very crucial key thing like is going to continue to exist in some form. Like I believe in my heart and soul that it's going to find a way. The New York Times story about this is excellent. We'll link to it in the episode description. And the wider dance world is belatedly mourning the death of Mary Ellen Moylan, who passed away in April 2020 at the age of 95. She was once dubbed by Maria Tallchief as the first great Balanchine dancer. She got her start at the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo and originated numerous Balanchine roles there and at Ballet Society, a precursor to New York City Ballet. You know, whatever your feelings about George Balanchine, if you have not yet seen the 1989 documentary Dancing for Mr. B, you should watch it ASAP. Um, Moylan is one of the six ballerinas who are featured, and it is thrilling to hear this part of ballet history told by the extraordinary women who danced it, because we do not hear their perspectives enough. Yeah, and the footage is incredible breathtaking and allegra kent holds a flower for her entire interview and it's just so on brand it's wonderful (laughs) anyway so in our first roundtable segment this week we're going to discuss a story that feels especially important and relevant given everything that's happening in the mainstream news right now Um, This past week, Dance Magazine ran a piece about Cultivating Better Tomorrows, which is a consulting business founded last year by former Joffrey Ballet dancer Erica Lynette Edwards. 
And they're working to make the performing arts more inclusive and equitable. They lead anti-racism trainings and workshops and strategic planning services for arts institutions and in particular dance institutions. And Edwards is sort of a veteran of community engagement. She was the Joffrey's director of community engagement for five years after she retired as a dancer back in 2014. And in her interview, she talks about the challenges of anti-racism training in dance specifically and about what Cultivating Better Tomorrow's goals are, um, starting with the goal stated outright in its name. Yeah. So as you said, Margaret, in the interview, Edwards mentions that literally the goal of this organization is to cultivate better tomorrows. And a big part of that is both recognizing and breaking the cycle of trauma as tradition in the dance world. I thought it was really amazing. One of the things Edwards says is that she wants people coming out of a dance class, whether or not they want to be a professional, to have joy. And I think that's just such an amazing goal. I think it's something that we really honestly forget about a lot in dance, that joy is why we're here and it's what we're trying to cultivate, whether or not we're trying to be professional dancers. But how do we do that? Well, Cultivating Better Tomorrows works within the dance community to lead anti-racism trainings, guided conversations, racial healing circles, DEI sessions, organizational consulting, and educational webinars. So just a lot of different kind of aspects of DEI work, which we've talked a lot about on this podcast. And I think in particular why this story seemed really important to us is that we've talked about the need for dance organizations to not put the labor of DEI work on BIPOC dancers and creatives who often aren't paid for that additional work. This organization is a great way for dance organizations to hire qualified professionals to help them with DEI work. So there have been a handful of stories we've discussed on this podcast over the past few weeks that have prompted me to say, weren't we just talking about this a year ago? And looking at the mainstream news cycle we're in this week, it's been very much this feeling of like, here we are, again, Mm -hmm. still. And that cycle is going to keep repeating unless we, all of us, demand that it be broken and unless we do the work. And in the dance world, in this article, Erica references cycles of trauma, generational Mm -hmm. cycles of trauma. And so in the next world, this is this is true of so many things beyond racism, but looking specifically at racism, you know, the name Cultivating Better Tomorrows is so striking, especially right now, because racism is too systemically entrenched both in our wider society and in so many dance organizations that it's not something that is going to be undone overnight. It's something that we have to cultivate. These environments, these actively anti-racist environments have to be cultivated. We have to start the work or it's never going to happen. And also, it is a continuing process. Uh, if, If this was something that could be one and done, you check the box and it's gone, we wouldn't be back here a year later still having this same conversation. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things Edwards talks about. She says that leadership needs to not think of DEI as one aspect. You don't just say, okay, we've got diversity now. She wants you to dig into the bigger questions, like what microaggressions do Black dancers experience once they're in the space? What responsibilities do you put on their shoulders as they come into that space? And I think it's also worth noting, we have a tendency to think of the studio, right, of being like, when you're in these four walls, you... All that matters is the work that you're doing. It's just the dancing. You leave everything else behind. So even if you manage to cultivate a space where dancers of color and specifically Black dancers aren't facing any microaggressions in that space, that doesn't change the reality of stepping outside of the studio. We are living in a racist country. Mm -hmm. And ignoring that isn't recognizing the totality of these dancers and these artists' experience. Yeah, you you touched on this in something you were saying earlier, Cadence, but when Edwards is talking about this divide that she saw in the professional concert dance world where the majority of leadership was white, but anyone involved in community engagement was BIPOC. And not only is that putting that labor on people who probably aren't being compensated properly for the work they're doing, it also creates this huge disconnect in this like siloing of perspective so that the white people at the top can say, okay, yes, we have checked the the DEI box. Mm -hmm. We have people working on that without ever truly engaging with or understanding the needs of their community or the challenges that their dancers or students of color are facing. Um, So yeah, so part of what 
Cultivating Better Tomorrows is doing is helping to bridge that gap so that everyone in all parts of these dance institutions can do the kind of critical self-reflection that actually leads to real change. This sort of ultimate quote at the end of the article, she says, my partners and I recognize the cycle of trauma as tradition in the dance world. So it's not just that we keep seeing these cycles of trauma, it's that they're actually baked into the way that we operate. Mm -hmm. And some people see them as things of value, these systems that are hurting so many people and especially people of color. So it's a long past time to eliminate that way of thinking. This profile ran last week because Cultivating Better Tomorrows hosted a virtual summit last weekend with a totally incredible lineup of speakers. So that event has come and gone, but please do visit their website and their Instagram page to get a better sense of the work that they're doing and of what's on the horizon for them. They're at cultivatingbettertomorrows.org and at cultivatingbettertomorrows on Instagram. So next in our lineup today, we have a story that just like delights my contrarian heart. Forbes ran a piece that counters the popular narrative about how we need to invest in STEM rather than in the arts and humanities because, you know, tech and engineering, that's where the future of work is. And during the pandemic, especially, we've heard all kinds of arguments along those lines, like the whole terrible Fatima's next job could be in cyber campaign, like, yikes. Um, but the Forbes article says that this kind of thinking, as we already know, is misguided, and that in fact, STEM fields need and are actively looking for creative thinkers. They're looking for artists, and they're looking specifically for dancers. I think that kind of the basis of this story is, some, is this narrative that we've all heard time and time again, that education should focus both funding and resources on STEM training, because that's the best way for people to find jobs. There are a few quotes in this article that I think will really hit home for all of us, like Kentucky Governor Matt Bevin saying, there will be more incentives to electrical engineers than French literature majors. There just will. All the people in the world that want to study French literature can do so. They are just not going to be subsidized by the taxpayer, which I think does you know, kind of sum up the feeling that a lot of leadership in the United States and elsewhere has had towards funding for the arts in past years. But I think that the really interesting point that this story makes is that this focus is actually misdirecting those coming into the workforce away from what the industry needs, and that many of these tech, coding, STEM companies are actually now seeking the creative and humanist thinking that emerges from studying the arts. Because as the rise of artificial intelligence and machine programming is just continuing, an arts background actually brings really valuable and important insights. So a lot of these companies are actually now seeking out artistic, creative people who have these backgrounds in arts. One in particular, a leader at a coding institute said that the patients that artists learn in their work can be really beneficial to the mindset for coding. We know how to make mistakes. We know how to start from scratch without a skill set. And that's the kind of thing that will really benefit you in these fields. Well, and I think on the one hand, right, there's this like practical application of it, of like, Arts and humanities training gives you like practical tools that can be applied to this field. But there's also the aspect this hasn't gotten as much into here, but look at what's been happening with various big tech over the past decade in terms of talking about data collection, in terms of the way these tech new technologies are handled and whether or not they're being handled in an ethical way. The study of ethics mm -hmm. is humanities. Like humanities and the arts are all about teaching you how to question. Arts and humanities, in a lot of ways, I think can be summed up by learning how to ask the question, what if? Both in terms of ethical application of new technologies, which as we've seen, a lot of what the issues in Silicon Valley over the last decade have come from completely divorcing ethics from technology from not mm -hmm. asking the what if question from the perspective of is this good for humanity actually but also just in terms of creative problem solving which yeah. is a lot of what this story is getting at yeah and sorry to bring us down from the realm of philosophy and into sort of like more practical skills but when we're talking about practical skills a lot of the emphasis on stem comes from the idea of building people with these highly specific skill sets tech specific skill sets but the article points out these fields are actually advancing so rapidly and becoming so highly automated that those kinds of skills become irrelevant so fast, especially now. And what tech actually needs are the bigger creative minds, minds that can leverage technology in innovative ways to solve larger problems. Um, and if you can think about those problems ethically as well, more power to you. 
yeah, I don't know. It's just like yet more confirmation that artists and especially dancers are, first of all, some of the smartest people in the world, but also they're a critical part of not just culture, but also industry. Like so often when we're talking about the value of dance, we're talking about it's like spiritual, like life affirming value, which of course is a valid thing to talk about. That is huge. But dance skills are also valuable in an economic sense, too. Like, here are reasons to hire dancers, tech companies. Well, and something that Katie Kwan talks about specifically, essentially, she's talking about experience design, but talking specifically about working with robots. And talk- mm-hmm. And she was saying that once we have robots in public facing sectors, we know based on scientific research how we respond to something new as humans, a lot of what we're responding to is based in movement. It's not color. It's not the way it sounds. It's the way it moves, the way that we understand it as a mover. And you only have a couple of shots before the human is going to be, this is too weird, or this seems (laughs) dangerous. I'm not engaging with this. And if you're a you know, corporation that's invested a lot of money in these public facing robots, the last thing you want is for the general public to be like, yeah, no, no, I can't deal with this. Because then you don't like that's a bad investment. So a lot of what Katie talks about is let's talk to dancers and movement specialists to figure out how to program these robots so that they seem approachable and people want to have them around. Yeah, Dance Magazine did a great, of course, that great piece with Katie Kwan about being a robot choreographer a few months back. And we'll link to that in the episode notes, too. Moving on, because we got it. Um, so our last roundtable segment this episode is going to be another one of those, like, taking stock at the pandemic's one-year mark moments. Um, over the past week, there have been a few different stories highlighting what different members of the dance community have learned from a year's worth of making and viewing on-camera dance. Point Magazine did a story about how dancers have adapted to performing on film. Dance Magazine talked about institutional approaches to on-screen dance, specifically about this film now, perform it on a stage later model that several companies have followed. And then dance writer Martha Ullman West published an essay from the viewer's perspective. So we want to get into all of those stories. And then we also want to talk a little about what we, the three of us, have figured out about how we engage with film dance during what Martha has called this year of living cautiously. I mean, something that I, we said this from the get-go, and it's been interesting having that reinforced, is that creating dance that is intended to be film and is intended to be consumed as film is a very different skill set from creating dance that is intended to be put on stage and viewed that way. Um, And I have found that my experience as a viewer has actually kind of mirrored that in a lot of ways. I've realized that when I sit down to watch a digital dance piece, the way that I'm engaging with it is much more similar to how I engage with film or television than it is in the before times when multiple times a week we would all file into theaters and watch live performance. Um, It's fascinating because even though I am still watching dance and like those, you know, choreographic analytical muscles are still going off in my brain the way that i am actually actively engaging is much more similar to the way that i watch film just to to tie this all back to some of the the stories you're mentioning because it is a totally different set of skills that you're learning several sources in a few of these stories talked about how making work for the camera improved their like mind flexibility like figuring out different types of performance energy that are camera appropriate figuring out dance that is going to be seen both on a screen and on a proscenium stage. It just, it's developing a different type of adaptability and those are skills that they can bring with them into post-pandemic life, which I thought was interesting. I think that I mindset of stream the dances now, see them live on stage once public health guidelines allow, for me was one of the most interesting things about this story. And I think mostly because it taps into something that I, and I think we have been saying for a while of, the need for both streaming content and live content and why both dance and theater and so many other industries should embrace that opportunity. This exactly shows us that people will still want to see live performances, even if they have literally already seen the performance streamed, because there is a different aspect to that. And it just goes back to, I think it was when Hamill Film first came out, we were saying that more thing, more shows should be available for streaming because the audiences are different. They will often Mm -hmm. see both. And I just, this is one of those things that it's one of those, can we keep it after the pandemic? Can we keep streaming performances? Because people will watch it from home. They will watch it live. You are not going to lose ticket revenue. People want people to watch it. 
please just keep streaming, streaming art. It's so important. Well, and I agree if we can find a way to keep this. However, key caveat, can we find a way to fund this? Because as was yes. also pointed out when we discussed hashtag Hamill film, you know, they fronted the money to film that and it's ex- it was extremely expensive. So, mm-hmm. th- and this is a whole other set of people that you also are going to be paying in terms of your cinematographer, all of your film crew, all those things. I want this to keep going because I was a kid in South Louisiana who did not Mm -hmm. see a professional dance company until I was was like 14. And most of what I learned about ballet, I learned from watching DVDs of ABT. (laughs) Like the amount of access that has happened over the last year, like I would have been absolutely gaga over that growing up so yes make it available but also we need to fund it can we just fund everything funding everything's about funding (laughs) yeah yeah accessibility another theme that came up in all these pieces it does seem like now that there are some systems in place now that they have done this filming process once hopefully that will smooth the pathways a little bit going forward and maybe some of the overhead costs there have been taken care of in a way that will make it at least a little bit less expensive going forward to film and stream dance. Fingers crossed, because I agree, Courtney, we got to fund everything. Um, My, like, personal take on this is that it's so funny. At the beginning of the pandemic, I assumed that I was going to hate watching performances that were filmed in a theater on a stage that were, like, filmed the way they were regularly performed. I thought that was going to make me sad. I thought it was going to be flat and boring. And I thought I was going to be totally invested in like new dance works made completely for film, entirely of that medium. And it turned out that the exact opposite was true, (laughs) where I, I mean, I think I just had very little stamina for dance on screen generally, probably related to screen fatigue generally. But Mm. the dance I was able to get through was either dance that approximated a real theater going experience very closely or that was filmed in or around a theater environment because my heart just missed that theater experience so much that it was comforting to be like virtually inside these spaces. Not that that's any profound insight. I miss theaters. But I think it's, I mean, literally nobody in any of these stories is arguing that film dance will ever replace live dance, as Cadence said. And I think over the next year, you know, fingers crossed, we're all going to be doing a lot of happy crying and a lot of different theaters (laughs) please i can't wait all right we're gonna take a break and when we come back we'll have our interview with duke dang so stay tuned hi again dance friends i am very happy to be here now with duke dang the general manager of works and process at the guggenheim hi duke how are you good thank you for having me margaret Thank you so much for coming on because you are one of the busiest people in the arts world right now. So I appreciate you making the time. Um, Duke has led works in process for nearly 15 years. If you are an arts person in or around New York City, you probably either know Duke or at least know of him. He is a prominent and widely respected leader in this scene. And he's helped make works in process itself a notable leader well, for a long time, but especially during this past year, as the series has piloted innovative approaches to pandemic era programming and performance. So that's the short bio. Um, But Duke, would you start out by telling our listeners a little more about yourself and your arts background and your relationship to dance in particular? Absolutely. So um, I am an arts administrator through and through, and I've always seen it as what I do as an arts administrator makes it possible for artists to do what they do best. And um, what I do best um, is what uh, makes makes it possible for artists to do what they do best. And, you know, oftentimes um, artists um, aren't interested in doing what I do. And uh, so they're happy to let me take over. But um, I went to uh, BU undergrad, studied art history, um, had so many internships and uh, uh, in the performing arts and the visual arts at Glimmer Glass, at the Boston Symphony Orchestra, at um, Sydney Theater Company, um, in the performing arts program at the Getty Center. Um, and of course, as an intern here at Works in Process between my junior and senior year. Um, And so I fell into this um, very specific niche of performing arts in museums. And uh, when I did my grad work at NYU in performing arts administration, I ended up writing my thesis on performing arts in museums. And um, that's how I ended up at Works in Process. And uh, I've been here ever since. 
So New York arts people are really familiar with works in process, but for people who are a little farther afield, can you explain what the series in a typical year, what it looks like, and more broadly, what its mission is? Yes, we are completely focused 100% on the creative process of artists. And so rather than presenting straight performances and premieres, we always illuminate that creative process and try to make it possible for audiences to go behind the scenes. So we always have the creators there showing what they're creating at any given moment and then discussing that. So you really hopefully walk away having gained insight into the artist's intention. So the bulk of our programming before the pandemic focused specifically on that discussion, performance highlights blended together, all leading up to premiere. And what was very exciting was that oftentimes this was the first time that audiences would get to see um, this work. And it was oftentimes the first time that an artist would have an audience. So they're testing this material. It was really a laboratory. Yeah, the show before the show. Right, <laughs> right. Um, and then Works in Process made, I mean, just an astonishingly fast pivot once COVID did hit last year. Can you talk about what your your thought process and your focus was during those first days of the pandemic and then how you ended up launching your virtual commissions so quickly? Yeah, you know, we are a very artist-centric organization. Our staff is very, very small and very nimble. Um, we just don't have the bureaucracy, so we could move very, very fast. And the immediate response was to hear, I mean, what happened was so many artists just said, um, receiving cancellations across the board, walls of cancellations. And we just said, we are not going to cancel on the artists that we have committed to. We're going to find a way of continuing to support them. And then it turned into, we're going to try to support even more artists than the artists that we have committed to. So the first step was, well, we don't have access to brick and mortar space anymore, but we still have a platform. So let's just start virtual commissions. And so we started inviting artists who um, had been at Works in Process, were alums of the program, to create video works at home. Uh, we offered a fee. The parameter was that they had to maintain social distance and um, it had to be less than five minutes long because we were aware that this was going to be um, distributed across a digital platform. So by the time April rolled around, um, we had uh, probably about 50 or 60 commissions at that point. And we just started to premiere them as they were submitted. Um, and um, we just wanted to provide um, a platform for artists to continue to create with the belief that artists have the ability to reflect the moments that we were experiencing at that time. But we realized that that really wasn't going to be enough. Um, and as an organization that champions the creative process, we said, well, let's just take the in-person audience completely out of the equation because it just wasn't possible. How can we as an organization support the creative process of artists? And um, so I was very fortunate at that time. Um, my husband and I have a house in the Hudson Valley. And uh, nine years ago, we actually uh, helped co-founded the Hudson Valley Dance Festival. And so we were very aware of the dance uh, residencies that exist in the Hudson Valley. And I started making phone calls to Petronio, to Cat's Bond, to Mount Tremper, saying, what's happening with your space? And everybody said, it's sitting empty. And, um, and also at that time, the infection rates were so high in New York City, yet so low in these rural communities in upstate New York. And um, as we said, well, what if we were able to safely bring artists into these residency spaces that sit on over 150 acres and isolate them on these spaces and make it possible for them to gather and create again? And um, so our, our board liked the idea, but they said, um, we just really need medical counsel. And um, so we reached out to, or we were introduced to Dr. Wendy Zychek through Nikki Atkins-Fert. 
And Dr. Zychek um, said, well, you know, I can access uh, rapid testing um, antigen as well as PCR. And so it's May. And at this time, um, test results were coming back in seven days, six mm -hmm. days, 10 days. Um, and testing just wasn't readily available. Yet she said, I can help you access reliable rapid PCR tests that you can get back in two hours, which now seems common, but in May of 2020, it, it was finding a, a, a nugget of gold. And also at this time, we were able to get our hands on Tyler Perry's bubble protocol because Tyler Perry was planning on um, having residency uh, or filming in his in a bubble in Atlanta. So we were looking at, you know, a movie moguls production. Um, wait, 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 back up for a second. Yeah. How did you get your hands on Tyler Perry's protocol? I need that story. You know, it was in, I think it was the Hollywood Reporter. It was actually like readily available. Oh my gosh. And, and also I was talking with Anna Glass at the time at Dance Theater Parlum as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she also had this idea of like, maybe we could bubble. So um, we got our hands on that protocol and it was, well, we can't charter a private plane to fly artists, but we could charter a private bus and get artists to a bubble. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had the testing side solved as well. And while we didn't own a residency center, there were all these residency centers that were sitting empty in upstate New York that could accommodate these artists and provide a safe harbor. So um, that fell into place. And then the third thing that we had to really think about was it's June. Um, there still are no gigs. Artists don't have performance opportunities. And here we are offering them a gig to create, to perform, to rehearse. And we said, is it the ethical thing to do? And so we reached out to Dr. Robert Klitzman, who's the head of bioethics at Columbia University, who's a friend of the program. And we outlined the whole program. And uh, Dr. Klitzman said, you know, what you're doing is you're providing a lot of safety. You have a structure in place. Uh, we even were providing dancers with um, uh, enrollment into health insurance um, at that time. Um, and if these dancers accept the opportunity and you've done everything possible in your power to create a safe environment, then it's ethical. So I give you permission to move forward with this from an ethical perspective. And so that's when the board um, approved it. And uh, that was late June. Um, it was about two weeks after the NBA had announced their bubble. Mm -hmm. And by early August, um, we had our first bubbles happening um, at Catspawn. So that's how that happened. And it was really um, based in our mission, which is we are works and process. And it was how do we continue to support the process of the artists that we champion? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, now everybody's bubbling. It seems like such a, a commonplace thing, but you were the pioneers. It is astonishing to think how much of that work you were the first people to figure it out. <laughs> it was really putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, very wild, wild west. But um, <laughs> thankfully, we did have, you know, the Tyler Perry template. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, we were also looking very carefully at what the NBA was doing in Orlando, because we were doing this simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we were very naive also, because we were thinking, oh, my gosh, by the time August rolls around, museums should be able to be reopen, fine. right? Yeah. And uh, we didn't think that theaters would reopen, but we said, well, museums would reopen. And the Guggenheim is a museum and it's very voluminous and the rotunda itself is very social distance conducive. And our hope was that we would be able to sequence these bubble residencies directly into live performance in the rotunda. Because we knew, well, COVID was still going to be around, but there's this magical window of opportunity on the last day of a bubble where the dancers have been isolated for 14 days and you don't just want to drive them back home and say goodbye. 
you know, you have them rehearsed and ready to perform. And so why not allow them to perform on that last day before they go home? Uh, because once they go home, the bubble's been pierced. So you were you were right. You were just like eight months off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because by the time August rolled around and these artists were um, in their bubbles, it was clear that museums weren't going to open um, and we still didn't have a home to or a final destination for these projects. I mean, what was fortunate is that because um, all of our most of our bubbles were at Cat Spawn. All of our projects were then folded into the Cat Spawn Festival. So those performances mm -hmm. were co-produced by Works in Process and Cat Spawn together. So those were some of the first outdoor permitted performances in America. But um, again, it goes back to, well, where, what's the final destination for these projects? And that was when we were just casting about looking for presenters that would consider co-presenting video performances with us um, and uh, it was August and September and Lincoln Center has this big outdoor uh, campus and um, people were comfortable performing outdoors and Lincoln Center said wait 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 you've mitigated all this risk for us you've put these artists in a bubble for 14 days you've touched them you know that they're COVID free yeah of course we would love to have these companies come onto the Lincoln Center campus and perform. And that's how the Works in Process at Lincoln Center video series ended up coming to life because we just didn't want to have these artists go home on the very last day. And uh, what was also wonderful was it, um, bringing Lincoln Center on board provided additional fees for these mm -hmm. artists. I mean, the exposure is wonderful, but you know, money is money. What, what artists need right now are fees. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you talk a little too about when and why you decided to chronicle those residencies, those first series of residencies in the Isolation to Creation docuseries? Yeah, yeah. It was, um, again, I always go back to what is the mission of Works in Process, and it's to allow audiences to go behind the scenes and to illuminate the creative process and to tell that story. And um, we knew that our audiences couldn't go into the bubble. They couldn't follow these artists in person. But the, a docu-series would enable audiences to take that journey with these artists um, at this very specific moment in time. So it, was, uh, it made a lot of sense in terms of what is our mission, but also the Works in Process archives live um, in the Jerome Robbins Dance Division at the New York Public Library. And we had been having many conversations with uh, the curator there, Linda Murray, yeah. about how this particular moment in time is so historical. Mm -hmm. And how do we capture this moment? And the Jerome Robbins Dance Division was very supportive in saying we can provide filming support if uh, this docu-series is able to happen and we we were going to make it happen. And initially we were just going to release it ourselves on social media, but we wanted to have um, a broader distribution. And uh, so we reached out to All Arts Channel 13 and they said, we love the idea of the series. We'll license it, you produce it, we'll put it on TV, we'll put it on the All Arts platform. And uh, we just knew that that just made a lot of sense because it would ultimately expose these journeys that these artists are experiencing and, and help to um, uh, really peel back these, these layers so that the audience could, could, could see what these artists are experiencing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it felt like there's a, a matching of medium and moment there too in that the way that it was filmed like the dancers had their own cameras that sense of of intimacy of being inside the bubble with them that felt so spot on yeah it, we really and that's back to our mission which is we always want to go behind the scenes we always want to illuminate the creative process and we always want to put the artists front and center and uh, we felt that the docuseries would, would would be able to do that well, so now we're at a moment where artists are slowly beginning to return front and center in live performance. Um, back at the Guggenheim with your series of one night performances that's happening now. Um, and again, you're all, you're pioneers. You're among the first 
in New York City to return to in-person performances. Can you talk about when the planning for all of this began? Like when you started to think, <laughs> we're ready to come back? Yeah, well, it, it goes back to ni- in our naivety in June, we thought that the museum would open in August and we would be able to have live performances in the rotunda. That mm-hmm. the museum actually didn't open until October. Um, and uh, so we just knew it was just too tenuous to push this idea of let's have live performances in the rotunda, even though the bubbles were still happening. Um, our last bubble actually in 2020 ended um, uh, at the end of October. But we were so fortunate in that the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation came through with a half million dollar grant, which enabled us to produce 12 more bubble residencies in the first half of 2021. And so we said, okay, now we have a pipeline. We can start continuing this pipeline of work creation. And it was thinking again, how, what's the exit strategy for these bubble residencies? Because we didn't want the artists to just go home. So it turned into, well, the museum liked the idea, but the museum couldn't green light the, the live performance it had to be done at the state level um, whether it's through the governor empire state development or the department of health and so it turned into really a game of um, the squeaky wheel and constantly trying to figure out who are the powers at the highest level that make these decisions Mm -hmm. and um So through multiple channels, Empire State Development, through uh, New York State Council for the Arts, through uh, politicians, um, we eventually were able to loop into a consortium of flex space presenters that were making this case at the state level. That we understand that theaters, conventional theaters with fixed seats, proscenium, are not going to reopen but there are alternative venues that could possibly reopen. And so Works in Process was added to that list um, through uh, Shade Lithcott, who is the executive director of National Black Theater. And um, this was early 21, and uh, the governor had announced a pilot initiative for um, reopening of the performing arts. And uh, so, after filing a lot of paperwork, we finally received a site visit from the Department of Health. Um, And the Department of Health had piloted a program um, where the Buffalo Bills were having their playoff games in upstate New York. And they were able to rapid test 10, I think it was 10,000 fans to see two playoff games in upstate New York. And that gave the state the confidence to move forward with, well, we can, gather people in a safe way. Let's Mm -hmm. see how we can do it for the performing arts. So it was uh, February 5th and the Department of Health visited the museum and um, they walked into the building and they said, okay, we completely see why the Guggenheim Rotunda is on this flex space. And for those that have not been in the Guggenheim Rotunda, it's a spiral ramp a quarter mile long. That's six levels and uh, with a big atrium in the middle that's 95 feet tall. So they walked in and they said, we completely see mm-hmm. how performances can happen in this space, but also let's get to the nitty gritty. The Guggenheim Museum before the pandemic was housing some of the world's most valuable artwork. And these artwork need to exist in a certain condition, which means that the air needs to be very clean. And so the museum already had a double burr filtration system with UVC light. Um, Also with paintings, you can't have dry air. So the museum keeps the building at 55, 50% relative humidity at all times. And the higher the humidity, the lower the viral transmission rate. Um, and also, you know, the, the, the higher the humidity, the, the less chances of a painting cracking. Mm-hmm. So between the architecture and between the infrastructure in the museum, the Department of Health says, you guys are really well positioned to host live performances. So we received um, the site visit on uh, February 5th. And on February 9th, um, the governor announces NY pops up. 
and includes works in process at the Guggenheim in that press release. And so we knew we were off to the races at that point, and it was just receiving the final flex space guidance. And we received that on March 5th um, before um, other venues. And so once we got the green light, we just said, well, when is the next time that we have a bubble exiting? And that'll be our first live indoor performance. And it ended up being Caleb Teicher and company with Conrad Tao. Uh, They were creating, um, their plan was to create a new Rhapsody in Blue. Um, And we premiered that project on March 20th, which um, as far as I can tell is the first permitted indoor live performance with audiences on that scale in New York State. It's pretty incredible. And this is, everything about this story is why we need more good arts administrators everywhere, because it's not the sexy stuff. It's the behind the scenes stuff that has to get done. It's being the squeaky wheel. It's talking to literally all of the people. It's having all of your pieces lined up so that you're ready to go at the right moment. Yeah. And and really, it's people say, well, you know, what's your strength, Duke? And I say, well, it's it's that I usually don't like to take no for an answer. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's 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 that squeaky wheel. Let's try to find a solution. Let's be innovative. And if there is an idea, what are how do you put the pieces of the puzzle together? Mm-hmm. Um, because your perspective on this whole scene is so valuable, and because we don't have enough people like you on the podcast, I'm going to jump into some really big picture questions. So, well, first of all, um, what have you personally? learned over this past year like in dealing with all of these challenges what truly surprised you or changed the way you approach your work and what aspects of your ideology or of your approach have have been reaffirmed you know i i think because i have been at works in process for so long 18 years now and i'm very much a process person i'm very a behind the scenes person um i think it's that process that has propelled me throughout this year. Like, how do we make things happen? But um, because that creative process is so much a part of our organization's DNA, we never really were um, stalled in our tracks. You know, we were never like this deer in the headlights. We were just like, well, what do we do to support artists? And how do we do it? What is the process to make this happen? And it was about, well, you know, times have changed, we can't do things the way that we have always done them. We have to find new partners. If people that we used to work with are not working with us, well, let's try to work with other partners. And that was what was very exciting about this year is it opened up so many new partnerships for works in process because um, we just had to find a way forward. And it was, and we can't do it alone. We had to do it with with, with partnerships. Yeah, one of the, the common themes I, th- I think we've all been hearing in the dance world over the past year, we've never been more separated, but we've also never been more connected. Right. I mean, out of necessity, it's the only way to survive. Yep. Yeah, and and it's, it's just, we can't be siloed. Um, mm-hmm. But it was also saying to the Guggenheim, well, you know, you're the most valuable asset that the museum has arguably is this iconic building which can play such a important role right now when the performing arts as a field for the most part finds itself even now homeless because of the infrastructure that was built up over the past century of theaters proscenium theaters with fixed seats um and saying to the museum you know you could really play a much major role so think about that and and that's the museum realized what a role the museum could play and so they said yes let's move forward and figure out how we can carve out this home for the performing arts right now Mm -hmm. here's the the biggest question of all um because obviously the arts dance in particular but all the arts are facing really strong headwinds right now so what's your big picture argument for why, you know, even in this moment that's challenging for everybody, why do we need to continue to make art support a priority? Well, 
I think for, so I'm going to talk about this from a New York City perspective, Mm -hmm. because unlike many places, New York City has actually seen this outward migration of population. People are, have moved out of New York City. So for the economic health of New York City, for the identity of New York City, for the cultural health of New York City, how do we get people to come back to New York City? And so as we have started to produce live performances right now, we're making a deliberate um, decision to severely reduce our digital offerings because now we're tapping into this idea of what is innately special to the performing arts, which is the performing arts are really good at gathering people. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need in New York City right now at a time when the city is so empty and people are not coming into the city. So we really see the value of what we're doing as, well, look, the performing arts are happening again in New York City, so come back. Mm -hmm. Oh, I really hope they do. I really hope we all come out of this. Yeah, because there's really a multiply. I mean, the arts are happening everywhere, Mm -hmm. but um, as a New Yorker and as a arts administrator, working for an organization that is New York based, you know, we, we, we still believe that there is New New York city is the capital of dance and it's an engine for dance making that resonates across the world. And so if New York city comes back strong, then the field will come back strong. Well, thank you Duke for being an important part of that engine. Thank you for sharing your insights and for everything that you're are doing to support the performing arts in New York City. Um, So what can listeners do to support you and your mission networks and process? And what do you all have on the horizon? What should we keep eyes up for? (laughs) Well, um, as I last said, we want people to come to live performances again. Um, It's important for the economy. It's important for the artists, but it's important for our souls. I mean, we have um, gone through so much and, um, the performing arts are going to play a role in healing us and nourishing us. Um, So come to our performances. Uh, We have pop-up performances um, every day through April 19th at lunchtime. We have um, today, um, we have uh, the 15th, we have the Limon Dance Company. Tomorrow we have Mark Moore. Saturday we have New York City Ballet. Sunday, Martha Graham. Monday, Paul Taylor. Um, In addition to the pop-up performances, we have many bubble Uh, residencies that are exiting into evening performances. So our next performance will be Dance Higginbottom on April 18th, and then Omari Wiles and Le Ballet Afrique on May 4th, and Sonia Taya and Efrat Ashery in June. Um, And uh, so come to these live performances. There's more information at www.worksandprocess.org. If you can't come to New York City, we do have a very robust YouTube channel with a lot of virtual commissions, a lot of works and process programs. And uh, the docu-series Isolation to Creation is um, can be streamed on uh, allarts.org. We'll include all the links to all the things in the show notes too, so people can access them, them that way. Thank you so much, Margaret. I said it earlier, but it's true. We don't hear enough of this side of the story, and I really appreciate you sharing your perspective. And thank you for letting me get real nitty-gritty. <laughs> we love the nitty-gritty. Nitty-gritty is important. Thanks again to Duke. Um, If you are in or around New York City, I really do hope you can make it to one or more of the Rotunda performances because there's pretty much no better way to return to live dance than in that beautiful Guggenheim space, you know, like stationed somewhere on that winding six story balcony watching the extraordinary dance artists on that lineup. Um, And also make sure to follow Works and Process on Instagram too. They're at Works and Process. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We will be back next week for more discussion of the news that's moving the dance world. Keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. Mind how you go, friends. Bye, y'all. The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, Lydia Murray, and Cadence Neenan. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those football sounds. Find out more about The Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com.
Point to Rise is the podcast for everyone in the ballet and wider dance community who wants more out of their life, business, and relationships. The podcast is committed to raising the bar by continuing the hard conversations that not only empower dancers, teachers, choreographers, and leaders, but also create solutions that will further ignite change. It provides you with tools to connect to yourself from within, bust through your fears, and take action so you can stop chasing what isn't working and start turning your passion into profit to ensure success on and off stage. Download episodes today at pointtorise.com.